Amen. Um, my youngest, uh, Gracie. Um, there was another father that I got to know that told me that I should take my daughters on daddy daughter dates. And so when they were young, I began to do that. And I just, I took that bit of wisdom and started to walk in it. And I got to tell you, uh, if you don't date your kids, man, you need to start because it's, it's, it's a good thing. And that might sound weird to you, but you've got to get people alone in order to get to know people. And you've got to get your kids alone in order to get to know your kids. Because sometimes your kids feel like they're part of a group. But if you really want them to talk and open up, you've got to spoil them just a little bit. And all God's parents said, amen. amen. Um, so I took Gracie to this great little place called Cold Stone Creamery. And uh, they did some fancy ice cream magic. It was really wonderful. And um, we would go there and we would eat ice cream and she would open up over ice cream. And I would, I, I'd make a playlist with all her favorite Adele songs um, and just a few Taylor Swifts in there as well. Um, and we would be driving to Cold Stone Creamery and she'd just be singing along at the top of her lungs uh, in the cab of my truck uh, while we were driving there. And it was just an absolutely great time. But when we sat down over that ice cream and began to talk, I would ask her questions like, okay, who's your best friend right now? And who used to be your best friend? And why are they not anymore? And what's your favorite subject at school? And who's your favorite teacher? And why do you not like this teacher? And we would go into all of the things. Like you could have 15 to 20 questions prepared before you show up, which I highly recommend. <laughs> why? Because she's worth getting to know. There's something about when you sit there and you have that kind of a dialogue, um, she realizes the spotlight is on her and she realizes that she is worth knowing. It's a powerful thing to get your kids alone. Um, it gets them to really reveal who they are. John 17, 3, these are Jesus' words. This is the way he says it. He says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Jesus takes this concept and he said, uh, we should be knowers of God. We should be people who are seeking after God, hungering after God to know him and know him deeply, not just know about him. That's theology, right? You don't need a seminary degree. You need a walk of friendship with God where you get to know him. And it takes time, doesn't it? It takes time. It takes effort, um, but he's worth the effort. If Gracie True Blood was worth the effort, God is infinitely more worth the effort. And he says, this is eternal life. What an amazing statement. Jesus is saying heaven and eternity, it's not about streets of gold. It's about knowing God. And if you begin the process of knowing God now, then you've got eternal life now. You're actually walking in eternity as we speak if you're walking with Jesus. And here's the thing, Gracie's worth it. Gracie Trueblood, she's brilliant. Can I tell you that? She is unique. She is feisty. And she has the divine spark in her. And, and by getting to know her, you can fool yourself into thinking that you're somehow giving something to her. No, no. I'm getting way more back than I'm putting in. Because she's changing me. When you get to know people, isn't that true? They change you. They enrich your life. Back to God again. As you get to know God, God shapes you in the process. The scripture says when we, when we look on his face, face to face, he changes us. We, we start to change into the image of God himself. Um, Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your hearts. We should be seekers of God, chasers of God, those who are hungry for God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all this will be added to you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We're called to chase after God and to get to know him, to want to get to know him. Imagine, like, you've got people that you admire in this life, right? 
Like maybe it's a, a movie star, maybe it's an author, maybe it's a philosopher, maybe it's a professor, whoever they are. Could you imagine if you had a five-year intimate friendship with that person? You got to walk out every day with them in close proximity. Get their views on the world every single day. Imagine that person that you were in that five-year friendship with. Say it was Mother Teresa. What would that do to you? What if it was Billy Graham? What if it was Abraham Lincoln? Wouldn't that kind of a relationship necessarily shape you? Of course it would. How much more infinitely is getting to know Jesus going to shape us into his image because he is love itself. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's, let's go to uh, Exodus chapter three. Um, we're gonna read about Moses because this is a moment, it's a major moment of God revealing who he is. And that's what everything uh, about today is about, is God revealing himself because he does not stay distant. He does not stay in the background he wants us to know who he is. So let me tell you about uh, Moses just a little bit so you, you know the context. Moses grew up, um, he was born to an Israelite family, but some things went down and I won't go into it, but he was adopted and he was raised by an Egyptian family. In fact, he was raised in the royal courts. But as he grew up, being an adopted person who had kind of two different backgrounds, two different families, he was confused as a young man. And he started to wonder whether or not his allegiance should really be to his fellow Israelites. The problem is, is that his fellow Israelites, they were in bondage, in slavery in that particular culture. And so one day Moses goes walking along and he sees a fellow Israelite being beaten physically by an Egyptian. And Moses steps in and he gets physical. He actually kills the Egyptian. So in that moment, he takes the law into his own hands. He tries to be a rescuer and a saver in his own way. And God's not so much about it. You ever try to do the right thing in the wrong way? Yeah, yeah we've all been there. And so he gets sent into exile for 40 years. He goes to Midian and he becomes a shepherd, a literal shepherd of sheep. Smelly, whiny sheep. 40 years in the wilderness. It's the wilderness of Sinai, actually. And while he's there for 40 years, God's got this guy on ice. This is what happens. Verse two in chapter three, there the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a blazing fire in the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it did not burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bur bush burning up? I must go see it. Just pause there really quick. Number one, the angel of the Lord um, if you get into this kind of stuff, this is probably a Christophany or a Theophany. This is a pre-incarnate Christ. This is Jesus before Bethlehem showing up in the Old Testament in this kind of angel of the Lord form because he's going to speak with divinity later on. The second thing is, when was the last time you saw a bush on fire that never stopped burning? Right, like it's not weird that this bush is on fire in the middle of the desert, right? Like that's kind of the kind of thing you might see. But it's the fact that it just keeps burning and burning and it never turns to ash. It never stops. It gets his attention because it would get yours. Verse four, when the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. And then Moses replied, here I am. Verse five, do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. If you were here with us the week that we did Ananias and Sapphira, we talked about the fact what, that when the Lord's presence and power draws near, so does his holiness. And that can be a scary situation. A um, lot of different moments in the Bible where that comes up. And so God gives him the prescription for this moment and says, the way you're going to get through this, Moses, you're, you're not going to come too close and you're going to take your shoes off. And that's the way that you're going to survive this. Verse seven, 
Then the Lord told him, I've certainly seen the oppression, my people in e- uh, the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. Now go, for I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. Now, this is a powerful text, actually. I'm just going to pause here for a second. If you're struggling with your prayer life, this is a great passage to go to. Because God gives us some really important things here. He says, listen, I know I haven't rescued my people yet, but it's not because I haven't heard their prayers. And it's not because I haven't seen their pain that they're going through. I have heard them and I have seen what's going on. And now I'm ready. The time is right for me to send my deliverer. Sometimes we are praying for something and we're trying to trust that God hears us. We're trying to trust that God sees our pain while we wait for his rescue. Have you ever been there in that kind of spot? That's a tough spot to be, yes? It's a spot where we need faith to believe that all of this is true. Verse 11, but Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. And he means the mountain of Sinai where he's going to get the 10 commandments. He's saying, it's going to go full circle, Moses. You're going to go and you're going to rescue my people out of the the Egyptian country. And you're going to bring them right back to this place. And you guys are going to worship me here. And that's going to be your future sign. Now, quick pause. He says, who am I? And he says it twice. This is a confused guy. Do you remember that? Am I Israelite or am I Egyptian? Am I royalty? Am I not? Am I a shepherd? Am I a leader and a savior? What in the world am I? And God doesn't answer his who am I question. God just says, I'm going to be with you. And that's important because in our culture, we're a little bit obsessed with our own identity. We're a little bit obsessed with trying to figure out who we are. And I get it. I want to know who I am too. And God in his grace often will come and he will give us identity statements and life purpose and sometimes even a new name like he gave to Peter. But what is more important than who you are is whose you are. And God says, I'm not telling you right now who you are, but I'm telling you that I am going to be with you and that's enough. Uh, Verse 13, but Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, then what is his name? What should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Okay, so Moses gets God's point. He stops asking about himself. He adjusts and he says, okay, it's not about my identity. It's about your identity. So what's your identity? So what's your name? Because they're going to ask me that. And God goes and gives him the divine name. I am who I am. And that is Yahweh. Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. He gives him his proper name. Not a title here. So the titles of God, like when you pray and you say, oh God, that's you giving a title and describing who God is, yes? In in the Old Testament, they would have said Adonai or Elohim. That would have been the title of God. Here he gives him his proper name, like David or Ricky or Joshua or Darren. He gives him a proper name. Yahweh is his proper name. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. And and, and get this, this is my eternal name, he says. My name to remember for all generations. God is underscoring this. You're gonna go and tell them my name? And this is eternally speaking, my name to call me Yahweh. Okay. Now I'm going to give you some stuff about Yahweh here. And some of it's going to be a little bit technical. Um, 
but I think it's going to enrich your understanding of the divine name, uh, Yahweh. If it's too much, just surf on your phone, and uh, we'll pick you back up in a couple minutes, and it'll be just fine. <coughs> Yahweh. Yahweh means I am. It means to be. Um, in some ways, it is vague to us, but in some ways it's incredibly profound what God is saying here in the I am, the I am, who I am. Yahweh, it's Y-H-W-H, uh, the scholars call it the tetragrammaton. It's because it's, it's four different uh, consonants. There's no vowels in between. Um, let me just say this really quick. I love kids in this room. Can I get an amen? amen. Kids are a sign of life in this room. If you've got kids in this room, praise God. Praise God that you've brought them today. And sound guys, I'm going to count on you to make me louder than them. Amen? <laughs> All right. Excellent. Okay. Um, there's no vowels in the Hebrew text. That's why you don't have the, the A, like Yahweh. You've just got the consonants right there. There's no vowels in the Hebrew, or, uh, yeah, no vowels in the Hebrew text. Um, and not only that, but just to make it more difficult, um, the only way the vowels were handed down from Jewish family to Jewish family, generation after generation, is they would speak it orally to them. And that's how they knew the pronunciation as you went down through the generations. But at a certain point, the Jewish people started saying the name Yahweh because it's the divine name. And if you know this, one of the 10 commandments is don't take God's name in vain. And they were so afraid of accidentally taking God's name in vain, they stopped pronouncing it to each other out loud at all. Whenever Yahweh was in the text and they would go to read it, they would insert Adonai instead. Some of your Bibles, if you look at your translation right now, instead of Yahweh, it put Lord there in all caps, capital L-O-R-D. And that's just your translator's way to say, this is the divine name. And they did the same thing. And so the negative for us is that today, we don't even know how it was pronounced. Yahweh. Um, it could have been Yehwah. It could have been Yehwah. <laughs> we say Yahweh, and if I'm being really honest with you, it's a guess. We're putting what we guess are the right vowels in there. And you're like, hold on a second. Like when I pray or when I sing or, or whatever else, like I want to say the name right. So do I. I totally get it. Will God be mad if we don't pronounce it right? No. I don't think God is looking for us to pronounce his name correctly. I think he's looking for us to understand the meaning of his name. And when we speak to walk in the meaning of his name. And, and, and some of us, we, we get really hung up on this. Um, do you know the Holy Spirit translates your prayers for you? The New Testament tells us that. One of the great kindnesses of God is that no matter what you pray to him, the Holy Spirit takes it like a messenger and a translator, and he cleans up all your wrong motives. Did you know that? And he cleans up all the wrong things that you say to God the Father before it even hits the throne. And we depend on his kindness to do that for us every single time we pray. So he can certainly handle when you say Yahweh with the wrong vowels, he can get it to the right destination. Amen? Uh, even when we were doing this, his name is Jesus thing. Somebody uh, wrote on social media, it's like his, his name is not Jesus, it's Yeshua. You're right. If you were in first century in, in that culture, it would have been Yeshua. It would not have been Jesus. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I care, but we call him Jesus and others call him Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And I think the Holy Spirit figures it all out for us. Even when it comes to Christmas, so some people will be out there on the internet and they'll be like, I don't think that we've got the right date for Christmas set. I don't think it matters. As long as you are worshiping the king at Christmas, that's what matters. And God takes care of the rest, amen? amen. Because you don't, even have a, you don't even have a chance of pronouncing Yahweh right. It almost sets me, sets me free just a little bit. Even pe people will come along and say, well, Jehovah, that's the proper name of God. In some church traditions, Jehovah is the proper name of God. 
the J sound does not exist in the ancient Hebrew. It's not even possible that it was Jehovah. And our first reference to the, to the, um, uh, to the pronunciation Jehovah with a J is in the 16th century after Jesus Christ. So no, it's not. The Holy Spirit fixes it, amen? I would recommend that when you pray to him, sometimes you pray to Yahweh. Or maybe you reference him as the great I am. Because there's something about the great I am, it's his chosen name for himself. And there's, there's something majestic about it. There's something that has gravity to it in calling him the I am. I uh, feel like it's a little bit like Mufasa in uh, Lion King, you know? So you just kind of tremble a little bit when you say it. I love it. Um, so what does the I am mean? Um, here's why I believe the I am means. Why did God call himself the I am? The very first uh, point is I would say it's because God is absolute. And the I am communicates he is absolutely him. He is not anything else but him. He is not relative. He is a person. He is not a philosophy. He is not a force. He is not a concept. He is. Do you see him demanding to be treated as a person? He is. The next thing is that he is eternal. He is not in the past. He is not in the future. This is a nod when he says, I am who I am is he's forcing himself into the present moment, into the now, no matter what. This is an indication that God is outside of time. And you're going to see this later in the book of John, that there is a space-time continuum and God stands outside of it. Kind of bakes your noodle, doesn't it? It does. I mean, it's a lot. But, um, I mean, get into the science just a little bit. You, there's an expansion rate on our universe. As soon as the scientists get in this expansion rate on our universe, we know that there's a, a finite moment in time where it began. And guess what? God is outside of that beginning. He was here before that beginning. And there, there's a moment when this universe will be over and God will be here as this universe is over. This space-time continuum is this space-time continuum and God is something else completely. Next, he is without comparison. Most names are a comparison to something else. When Jesus came to Cephas and he called him Peter, he was calling him rock. And he was saying, you're like a rock. My name is Joshua Dale. And Joshua means God is my salvation. Dale means from the valley. God is my salvation from the valley. Have you ever looked up your name before? Because there might be some fun things in there. But all of our names are a comparison to some other idea or object or concept when God comes and says, I am, what he's saying is he's incomparable. He just is him. Whew. Next, he's sufficient. No one sustains or holds up God. He's completely independent. You wouldn't be here unless someone was providing for you, providing all the things you need every single moment of the day, not even to mention your birth. God needs nothing. No, nothing in the universe is holding God up. He's holding up the universe. There's this great scene um, in the old 1970s Superman. And Superman is the best superhero, by the way. <laughs> and I love that his shiny um, red boots stay clean the whole movie long. It's so good. But there's this moment, if, if you remember it, and, and Lois falls off the building and she's plunging down to her death. And of course, Clark gets changed just in time and flies up to rescue her. And as soon as he grabs her, she says this great movie line, or he says this great movie line. He's like, it's okay, I've got you. And she's like, you've got me, who's got you? It's this, it, it, it's this idea of like, well, he's just so beyond, right? Now that's fiction. God is actually beyond. God is actually completely sufficient and independent all on his own, and he needs nothing to hold him up. Next, the I am communicates that God is constant. His constancy is what we count on. I am. I am. I am just. I am loving. 
I am full of grace and mercy, no matter what, and I will never change. I am. So the scripture says God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's constant. And then lastly, he is now, and he is near always. He is not stuck in, in your past, and he's not full of anxiety about your future. God is eternal, and God is now. Now, as we explore who God is and how he reveals himself, we're going to get a whole lot more from Jesus because Jesus comes to reveal uh, who God is in even greater depth. But first, I want to pause really quick and I want to acknowledge what we do sometimes as human beings when it comes to God is sometimes we make our own version of God in our own minds. And that gets in the way. So Voltaire said this, and he's an old French philosopher. He says, in the beginning, God created man in his own image, and man has been trying to pay, repay the fa favor ever since. <clears throat> and it is what we do. We say things like, well, I think God is like this. That's an opinion. That's not truth. Um, it, there's also built in under there this idea of, Whatever I imagine God to be is what he is or it's all that matters. It's not true. Even in your human relationships, do you want to get to know the version of your spouse that you've made up in your head or do you want to get to know the real them? Because real love only ever wants the real person. Real love. And it takes courage to want the real person, yes? Yes. It's tough. Um, we have a tendency to paint a picture of God. Uh, my daughter, Davy is at uh, college right now. And she's learning how to do animation. And so she uses a program called Maya in order to do animation. And in Maya, you go in there and you establish uh, 3D models. And then you make those models do things. And that's how you get some of the cool animation movies that you've got today. Um, so they were teaching her. And she told me this concept. And here it is on your screen. Um, what they'll do is they'll paint a picture for a movie frame. And they'll have someone down in this crouching position ready to jump like up there. And then they'll jump ahead like maybe five or six frames. And they'll paint another one. And then they'll jump five or six frames again and paint another one. And what Maya does with all of its math and brilliance is it says, if the elbow and the leg and the foot and everything like that's here in this frame, then when I jump over here, I'm going to use math to just say what the middle frames ought to look like. How good of a job do you think it does? Not the greatest. And so what it does is it uses math instead of normal human movement. So her professors have started to say, hey, listen, you've got to do as many of those middle frames as you possibly can because Maya will constantly get it wrong. Have you ever been watch watching one of the old animation movies before? You pause in the middle and it's all blurry craziness. And you're like, get, get away from that. Let's hit play again, right? And it's because as long as it's in motion, your brain is kind of filling in the gaps better than even Maya would. Anyway, all that to say, We've got gaps in our frames when it comes to God. We've got things that we understand about God because we read those verses or we studied those things. But we've got all these other gaps in our life that we don't understand about him. Here's the question. What do you fill those gaps with? Your imagination. This is why we read the Bible. This is... This is why we seek God and hunger after him and long to know the real God because his word is true and his word just isn't just true. It's the revelation of the real God, not the one that you've imagined. We fill the frames. We fill the frames with our culture all the time. When there's things that we don't understand about God, we we'll draw conclusions that God's morals match our current culture's morals because we're so modern and so intelligent and so educated. Of course, God must see it how our culture sees it. Not true. We'll fill the missing frames with our upbringing. I don't understand how God feels about me in this moment and I just failed. And whenever I failed my dad, my dad would get angry with me. So God must be angry. Do you see how you fill in the missing frames? 
And we do this all the time with stuff or, or, or we'll fill it with our wishful thinking. Like here I am in this moment, I'm praying for this thing and I really want money and success and a new boat. So God must want that for me. So we fill in the missing frames in our own imagination. We don't even realize we're doing it. We do that kind of stuff all the time. And I bet God agrees with my personal philosophy and my politics. I'm just sure he does. No, you need a chapter and verse on that. You need to study that. You need to let the Bible tell you who God is. Here's a, here, love only ever loves the real person. And love of God only ever loves the real God, the way that he's revealed himself to be. Another way to say it is truth has to be your number one. Let me challenge you to that. Just as a life rule, no matter what you're reading or pursuing or facing, you should, as a human being, want the truth. No matter where the truth leads you. And when you are seeking God, you should want the real God no matter if that real God is different from who you are. Because he should not be the one that changes. You should be the one that changes. And that's how it works. It's supposed to work. In our church community, I want to see us go to the Bible for our truth. Because this is where God revealed himself. Go to the Bible for your truth and have the chapter and verse. Because that's where God shows who he really is. Sometimes you've been in, in group contexts before where you're talking about God and someone says, I think God is like this. I would just say as kindly as I can, that's a foul on the play. That's okay, but that's an opinion. I have an old pastor that used to say this about God. That's a foul on the play. Um, my parents used to say foul on the play. This YouTube personality thinks this about doctrine. Foul on the play. Uh, I heard a prophetic message about thus and so. Probably a foul on the play. I'm not saying that they're wrong, but go and find the chapter and verse that backs it up or doesn't back it up, right? Um, the Chosen TV series, Linda and I have been watching that. It's a great series. Don't go into your small group and say, the chosen said this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love that series. It's so good. It just activates my imagination. But stop for a second and realize that you've got some human beings that are filling in a whole lot of missing frames about the life of Jesus. And they're using their holy imagination. And as fun as that is, as good and enriching as that can be, realize you need a Bible right here yeah. to make sure. Chapter and verse, God's revealed himself in his word, not through our opinions. Uh, chapter and verse, and, and when you're talking, take people to the scripture. Um, when I meet with people, we have a counseling meeting, and they ask me questions. I've got physical Bibles in the room that we meet in. I go and grab the physical Bible, and I open it up to the page, and I say, it's right here. Read it. It's right there. That's important because they need to understand I'm not the authority on their life. God is. And that's, that's how this whole thing works. Chapter and verse. Look it up. Ask a pastor. Google it. Don't Google the truth. Right? Google the verse that you forgot and get to the chapter and verse and then you're good to go. And it's not because we're fancy, guys. It's because we want to find the real Yahweh. Okay. John chapter 8, verse 48. You doing okay? Everybody all right? Yeah. All right, we're coming to the last section of scripture here. This is where Jesus connects to the Old Testament. He pulls it all forward for us. Um, but you've got a little bit of an argument to get through first. Verse 48, the people. Now, this is Pharisees. These are people who are, are mad at Jesus, against Jesus. And this is what they say. They retorted, you Samaritan devil, didn't we say all along that you were possessed by a demon? Now, what they're doing is they're making an identity attack on him. They're saying, you're a Samaritan, not a Jew. And you're possessed by a demon. You're not being led by God. Huge accusations against the character of Jesus. And he kindly answers them. Verse 49, no, Jesus said, I have no demon in me. 
For I honor my father and you dishonor me. And though I have no wish to glorify myself, God is going to glorify me. He is the true judge. I tell you the truth. Anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. Now this statement is about to get him into some trouble. He says, anybody who obeys the teaching of Jesus will never die. Now, he means spiritually, but they're about to take it as literal physical death. You're not even going to die. So they respond, verse 52, now we know you're possessed by a demon. Even Abraham, the prophets died, Jesus. But you say, anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Identity is the question. 56, Jesus answered, your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and he was glad. What I think Jesus means there is that Abraham, before he died, looked forward to the coming Messiah. He knew enough about the prophecies that had been made up to that point. He knew enough about the promises that God made to him that a Messiah was coming and that Abraham looked forward to that. The people said, verse 57, you aren't even 50 years old, which might have been like a retirement date for Levites at that time. We're not sure. I think that's what they're uh, referring to. Um, How can you say you have seen Abraham if you're not even 50 years old? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. And that's like a Mufasa moment. Did you feel it? Did you feel it kind of rumble through you? Before Abraham was, I am. It's a big deal. What we want him to say with the grammar and our understanding of, of space and time is you wanted him to say, before Abraham was, I existed. Before Abraham was, I was. That's what the question called for is tell me on some level that you were existing before Abraham. But no, man, they picked a fight with him. And he gives it to him big time here. They've questioned his identity. And so he tells them his identity. Before Abraham was, I am. Uh, If you know the languages, this is another technical moment here. Everything that we saw with Yahweh in the Old Testament, that was written in Hebrew. This text is written in Greek, ancient Greek. What Jesus says, ho, says here is ego I may. Ego I may. Um, it's the same construction as the Old Testament. <laughs> so I got to tell you about... Um, There was this translation that was made right at the time of Jesus because God is brilliant and all his timing is right. Amen. So when Jesus came, one of the things that happened in in, in translation is they took the Hebrew Old Testament and they translated it into the Greek of that day. It's called the Septuagint. And that was around the time of Jesus. And so they would have grown up like they, they knew the Septuagint. And when you go back to the Septuagint, it's like a secret decoder ring between the ancient Hebrew and the Greek at that time. God like froze it in place. It's amazing. But if you go back to Exodus 3 in the Septuagint, when God says Yahweh there, it's ego I me. So Jesus knew that they knew. So here he is in the Greek and he's like ego I me. He's calling himself the divine. He's calling himself the great I am. And if you don't believe it, look at verse 59. At that point, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. We don't know if he got invisibility powers in that moment or what, but he just got out of there because it was not his time to die. But they knew what he was doing. So Jesus looks back at all the Old Testament and says, I am the I am. I had somebody talk to me last week, sent me a message and said, um, they had grown up in a church context where Jesus was not considered God or the son of God. I would say, I don't know how that church tradition handles this passage of scripture because this and many other passages make it clear Jesus Christ was not a good moral teacher. Jesus was the divine son of God. John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And Jesus lays claim to that, 
to be the God of the universe, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Colossians 1.15, last tiny verse I'll give to you. It's not on the slide. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Everything that felt hidden to you about God that you wanted to be revealed, Jesus reveals it. So we're going to study for the next seven weeks, we're going to study Jesus and we're going to study his names that he gives to himself because he doesn't just use the I am there. He uses it over and over again in the gospels. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and life, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. Every single one of those statements, we're going to take an individual week and we're going to teach through that because it's an opportunity for you to get to know who Jesus is. Why don't you guys stand? We'll pray. Oh, Jesus, give birth to a hunger in us. Let us be hungry for God. To know him more, because this is eternal life now, to walk with him. And Jesus, come and reveal yourself to us, Lord. And God, if we're just starting out on this journey, God, then I pray for revelation and a spirit of revelation. I pray we'd be finding out new things about you all the time. And God, if we've been walking with you for a while, give us the humility to understand that we may have filled in some frames all on our own as we walked along with you. And God, you might want to come along and correct a few of those things. Jesus, would you give us the right vision of you? We want to love you for who you really are. In Christ's name, amen.